Hi, everybody. This is Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. And I am currently at Limud in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. And I have the great honor of sitting with Professor Lawrence Schiffman, who is the Lieberman Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies, Director of the Global Institute for Advanced Research in Jewish Studies at the Skirball Department of Hebrew and Judaic Studies, and a whole lot of other things. But I, he, was here, he was here in Limud giving quite a few lectures on his area of interest and of, of uh, expertise, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so thank you so much. It's, it's not so early in the day anymore. You've had a very busy day, as have I. So thank you so much for joining me here this evening. Okay, thank you. Good evening. So my listeners, I've got a very wonderful mix of listeners, both Jews and non-Jews. And the Dead Sea Scrolls is something that interests everybody. So first of all, maybe a little bit about yourself. How, where are you from? How did you get involved in this particular well, field? I was, I was a student at Brandeis. I grew up in Great Neck, New York. And I knew when I got there that I wanted to major in what they called Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. is the way they called the department. And I began studying Bible, Talmud. And at one point, I got to my senior year and I had to do an honors thesis. And I, of course, expected to go to graduate school. So... It was suggested to me by Professor Nachum Sarna, Zichrono Levracha, that I should do something about the relationship of the Dead Sea Scrolls poetry to the Psalms, to Sefer Tehillim. So I got going on that. And then I went into graduate school after doing that project. And I took a course on Dead Sea Scrolls. And you might say that I got bitten by the bug of the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, at that time, only 25% of the scrolls were available. But that was more than enough. Yeah, because remember, we're talking about the period before the scrolls were released as a result of the sort of takeover by a new team because they weren't being published, and that only happened in 1991. So when we're talking about is a period after 67 when Israel already controlled the actual museum where the scrolls were, but when the old team was being allowed to continue and they weren't really doing very much, and we had 25% of it available, but that 25% could keep you a whole lifetime studying. So that's how I got into it, and it fed my interests in both Bible and rabbinics, and was able to work on it together, and it then turned into a kind of a craze that really has been going on until now. So my understanding is that when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and begun to be studied, both Christian and Jewish theologians were a little bit nervous. I mean, here you suddenly have a blast into the past 2,000 years, uh, the, the waning years of the Second Temple period, more or less, the, uh, the beginnings, the birth of Christianity, and everybody's like a little leery. I don't know, maybe we're going to find something that undermines what we're thinking today. H- how, did, how did you deal with that? First, I'll tell you the humorous, extreme case of what you just said. A guy once told me that soon after the scrolls were discovered, there was a secret deal made. A bunch of Israelis went to the Vatican, and they had a meeting, and they all agreed that the scrolls wouldn't be published. And talk about the crazy conspiracy theory type explanation for the failure of scholars to get their work done. But that was the guy's, that was the guy's explanation. Now, the Blaming re- procrastination on the Pope. Yes. Now, the reality of the situation is that the scrolls, first of all, were all authored before the rise of Christianity. Now, from what we already knew about Second Temple Judaism from a variety of sources, the Apocrypha, which are those books in Catholic Bibles that are not in Jewish or Protestant Bibles, but they include like the books of Maccabees and Ben Sira, these are very Jewish books from the Second Temple period, plus a whole group of texts that we've come to call Pseudepigrapha, but there are other Second Temple books that are not in that collection. We already should have known, and of course, together with Josephus, we should have known already that there are no big shocks going to happen. So I think the notion of an expected shock that would worry anybody, Jews or Christians, was mostly what was propounded by kind of sensationalist press. And regarding the Christian side, which is where you heard the most of it, it was primarily Edmund Wilson's contribution, ironically with the help of some Israeli scholars who thought that the scrolls really were going to somehow reveal something about Christianity. It's his work that caused this whole kind of a craze, and it affected the whole way the scrolls are seen from then until now by people who don't really know what they are. Now, however, let's talk about regular responsible people, Jews or Christians. 
everybody understands really what it is. It's evidence for the development of Judaism that gives us much more knowledge than we had in the period between the Bible and the Mishnah. And for Christianity, it's evidence of ideas that were percolating in Judaism in the pre-Christian period, some of which have been absorbed into or influenced or provide context for understanding of Christianity in the New Testament. So in the end, there is nothing to scare anybody. But if you go to crazy theories or conspiracy theories, you can get all kinds of nutty things people will say. And I always had another way of looking at this. I said, look, Judaism and Christianity survived the rise of the theory of evolution and the age of the world and the Babylonian flood story and creation story and all this other kind of stuff. And they all survived. So there's no way you had to worry about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in particular, it would be like the Messianic idea or some of the people during the Second Temple period who, for many, many reasons, persecution by the Romans, whatever it was, were feeling like the, the, the coming was imminent and the, the, the Jews who feel that way are the ones who become the Christians? That is a partly correct statement because a lot of Jews were convinced, like the Dead Sea sectarians, of a kind of apocalyptic view of immediate Messianism. And this fed into different things. For those Jews who just stayed Jews, it ended up feeding into the Great Revolt because one of the revolt leaders was regarded as Messianic. And it fed in also into the Bar Revolt, as we know, between 132, 132 to 135 CE. And for Christians, it fed into an understanding, those Jews that were Jews and became Christians, that in their view, the Messiah had come. So there's no question that the apocalyptic messianism that we see in the Qumran scrolls helps us to understand that complex process, but not in a direct way. So let me give you an analogy, the way the scrolls relate to Judaism as it emerged in the Mishnah and Christianity. If you remember the old-fashioned telephone operator, mm -hmm. they had to pull these wires and went from one direction to the other direction and over. The switchboard. Yeah, the switchboard, right. Now, Many of the listeners probably never seen this thing in their life. <laughs> but the bottom line is that it illustrates the point that it wasn't things going in a straight line. It's all kinds of individual ideas which may become more significant in one place or the other. They may have come from one group or another in Second Temple times because there were numerous groups. And they combined to influence in a sorting out process the different kinds of ways of looking at Judaism and eventually Christianity, including the subgroups of Jews and Christians that emerge once you hit the first and second centuries. So I, I noted that you said the Dead Sea sect. Uh, who do you think the Essenes were? Because that's, that's a very interesting topic in and of itself. Did the Essenes write the Dead Sea Scrolls? Were there Essenes? Josephus mentions them. Uh, Pliny mentions them. What do you, what's your take on that? Let's just wipe away one silly theory that has been put forward. That is the crazy idea that Josephus invented the Essenes. This is disproven by a very simple fact. Josephus did not write all of Josephus. Much of Josephus was copied by his research assistants. And we know that the whole story of the Herodian dynasty was copied from his secretary of state of Herod named Nicolaus of Damascus. And Nicolaus of Damascus tells the story, the relationship of Herod to the Essenes. So there's no question Josephus didn't make up the Essenes. Also, Philo Judeus, who lived let's say around the time when Josephus was probably born, or maybe a little bit before, he wrote about the Essenes as well. So nobody made up the Essenes. There was a group called the Essenes. Well, we don't know what the word Essene means, either Essaioi or Essenoi, the two Greek forms. And it's not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls or in any Hebrew source. They're not mentioned directly by the Talmud or the New Testament. And therefore, we have this question because Josephus' description of them sounds very much like the Dead Sea Sectarians. That's why the majority view of scholars is that the Essene group is the Dead Sea Sectarians. There are problems with this point of view because they don't totally agree and also because of this business, the word never appearing, etc. But that is the majority view. Now, what I say about this, which is a little bit different, is that really once we understand that the halakha, the Jewish law of the sectarians, is that of the Sadducee system of Jewish law. We have to reckon with the fact that either this group has, is not the Essenes, or the Essenes themselves develop out of this group of dissident Sadducee priests that leaves the temple in the aftermath of the Maccabean Revolt, or probably in the aftermath of the rise of Jonathan, Yonatan, the, the Hasmonean, in 152 BCE. Now, if you buy that, you have to either modify the way we look at the Essenes, or take them out of the picture. Now, one other point. I always like to speak about what I jokingly call Essenoid, 
meaning that the Essenes are really a group of groups. Maybe Essene is a description of a kind of group, and those kinds of groups existed in several forms in Eretz Yisrael at the time, and the group we have is one of those within this wider perspective for which we just never encountered the name somehow that Josephus and Philo and the rest used in Greek. So they would be like a, a conglomerate of people who are dissatisfied with yeah. the way the temple is being run. They're not Sadducees. They're not Pharisees. They're just kind of people on the fringes or something well, like that? They're certainly, they're certainly not in the governmental and even financial mainstream. That's clear, the business mainstream, etc. So I think there's no question about that. The problem is that Josephus describes three basic sects as existing after about 152 BCE. Now, when you talk that way, you've got in your mind the parallel of listing the political parties in Israel or America or listing the Jewish movements in the U.S. So you assume that each one of these things is a substantial part and that they relate to one another. And then we can't understand if the Dead Sea sectarians, according to some scholars, are like a big influence on Christianity. How come the New Testament never even mentions these guys? One other point, the New Testament only quotes the books of the regular Hebrew Tanakh plus once a reference to Enoch. And what this means is they have the same biblical canon that the Pharisees had. Whereas at Qumran, there are some arguments for either a wider or different or unfrozen biblical collection. So one of the big problems that you have to answer is how come we never heard of the Essenes anywhere else? Mm -hmm. By the way, the Hebrew word ECM was invented by, in the Renaissance by Azariah de Rossi, who was the first Jew to realize that we should be reading Greek sources. And he started reading the New Testament and Philo and Josephus, which all had been preserved by the church, and brought them back into the study of Jewish history. So as a result, he created the word Isiim. So I once had somebody ask me in a Hebrew conference that I was speaking at in sort of a popular conference in Yerushalayim, and the guy asked, uh, this woman it was, not a guy, she, she asked me, Hayim Isiim, Hayu Isiim. Because she understood ECM to mean the people at Qumran, but she knew that Josephus is ECM, so what you mean it means are well, the Dead Sea sectarians should have any word to, to describe it. Of course, the, the, the cop out word in Hebrew is Kat Qumran, the sect from Qumran. But the bottom line is that what she wanted to know, but she only knew one word for all this, because ECM in modern Hebrew already, for all intents and purposes, means the guys at Qumran, whether it's the same guys or not. So maybe let's just take a minute for my listeners who are not so familiar. You have these different sects, if you will, in first century Judaism. You have the Essenes, we'll leave that aside for now. And you have the two main ones, there's Bethusias and others, but you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what is the difference between the two of them? And then for my Christian listeners, where do you think Jesus fits into this whole thing? Okay. The Pharisees are the ones who, now what I'm telling you right now is a combination of Josephus and looking backwards from the Mishnah. So the Pharisees are the ones who first of all have an unwritten law, what later becomes the oral law concept as we know about it. So they have an oral law. They are people who, let's put it this way, on a regular basis, they study Torah and teach Torah. Now besides the teaching of Torah, they're also involved in bringing Torah to a larger population outside of the temple arena. They also seem to involve people who are not in the real aristocracy for the most part. But this is a little bit misleading because they become the aristocracy after the development of the temp after the destruction of the temple. But they're, they're not in that aristocracy. And among their other significant beliefs are that the human being has free will, except that God could interfere if he wants to, but basically that the human being has free will. Whereas, for example, the Sadducees believe that there's no possibility of divine interference at all. And then the other big... Meaning that there's fate, that God like sets you on the road and that's it, or no, the no, opposite? No. The Sadducees believed that God has nothing to do with what's going on, like the Epicureans. And the ones who believe that there's real predestination is the Qumran sect. They believe that everything is predestination from before, predestined before you're born, like the Calvinists. Now, to get back to the Pharisees for a minute, so the Pharisees are also believing in an afterlife and also in angels. Now, then we get to a situation in which, right, in these descriptions in Josephus, he also discusses the Sadducees. We find that the Sadducees represent a more aristocratic group. 
And they also tend to be more literalistic in their interpretation of the Torah. Now, in parentheses, let me say that I think we've shown that the Dead Sea Scrolls can be used to get a better sense of what that system of interpretation is. It's a system of interpretation, but it's more literalistic. And then they don't believe in a separate law that's not the written law. And they also don't believe in angels or an afterlife, at least according to the text that we have of Josephus. Now, this is a pretty big disparity, mm -hmm. but I want to point out something. These are all, if we forget for a moment, the extreme Hellenists who came out of the Sadducees to some extent, the Maccabean period. We're talking about Sabbath-observing Jews who bring sacrifices to the temple, who observe the Jewish holidays, eat kosher food. I'm sure there were differences, but I think we have to remember that. This is not a question of people thumbing their nose at Judaism, because when you read Josephus, you find certain aristocratic Sadducees who do they're drinking the non-kosher wine that comes from who knows where and roads, et cetera, right? And all this kind of business. And that's not the majority of your Sadducees. Your majority of your Sadducees are very religious priests who are serving in the temple and really do believe in Judaism, but in the way that they understand it. So I stress that fact because it's not really like the movements of today that may argue that a certain thing in the Torah doesn't have to be done. Here the question is, we admit you have to do it. Do you do it our way or your way? And we just have to say about the Pharisees and Sadducees that apparently they had many, many differences regarding halakha, Jewish law. Well, they had more than just differences regarding halakha. At some point in the Maccabean period, they're killing each other. Well, it's not exactly that they're killing each other because it's those Sadducees that went to the extreme group that may have been in the early riots, et cetera, been uh, faced off against some elements that would have included some of the Pharisees. Remember that there's another group called the Hasidim that joined in the Maccabean revolt initially on the side of the Maccabees. They later turn out to require religious freedom, not political freedom. So they basically leave the Maccabean camp, but those are the ones who wouldn't even fight on Shabbat. Right. And this is, out of this comes the law that requires that we do fight on Shabbat if necessary. So in any case, well, what you see is that the Hasidim, some people wanted to claim that the Hasidim are the Pharisees or the Hasidim are the Essenes. Maybe the Hasidim aren't really a group. They're individual people. Whatever they are, there's another part of the mix. And so I think we have to get away from Josephus' three-sect model. And that's why I think there's room that the Essenes, at least as he describes them, and the ones at Qumran might not be the same exactly or might be under the same heading, but two subgroups, and who knows? So in terms of Jesus, where do you think he fits into all this? Well, Jesus, first of all, let's take a look at Jesus' as social message and ethics. It is all hyper-Pharisaic. It's just Phariseeism in, you might say, an extreme that for the most part we are supposed to observe also. Now, remember that everything that's attributed to Jesus is not all from Jesus. So some of it's from the writers of the Gospels. But assume that the core of it is basically Phariseeism. Look, he's quoted, what's the first mitzvah? And the first mitzvah is, love your neighbor as yourself. And why? Because you have to love God. So, I mean, he's preaching to a great extent some things that are Pharisaic teachings. Now, having said that, it's obvious that his view on halakha is much more lenient than that of the Pharisees. And that is what set off the process that eventually led the early Christians to abandon halakha and become a non-Jewish group. But having said that, we also need to realize that there is a feed into Christianity, and I don't know if it's a feed into Jesus or to the stage after him, of certain Second Temple traditions that are almost becoming underground when they don't get, don't get taken over by the rabbis of the mission. So, for example, if you look at the Shabbat laws in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're a strict version of the kind of thing you find in the Mishnah. But, but it's not all that far off. Like what? Well, let me give an example. It says in the, the first law in the so-called Damascus document, which is a Qumran document that was first found in Cairo Geniza, the first law that's given there is that Shabbat starts from the time when the sun is distant from the surface of the, of the, the horizon by its own diameter. So they say it's about 40 minutes. Now, this is the same as the rabbinic idea of Tosef at Shabbat. You have to start Shabbat before. So they start Shabbat a little bit before. It's the first law. This is just like the rabbis, they even quote the same verse. Shemort Yom HaShabbat Lekacho, observe the Sabbath to sanctify it. So it's the same thing. They believe the same thing about this. But on the other hand, they have two Shabbat limits. You can only go 1,000 cubits, not 2,000, under normal circumstances. But if you're pasturing an animal, then you can go 2,000. But they learn the whole thing 
from the same verses at the end of the book of Bamidbar, numbers that talk about the area around the city and how there should be an area around the city, including an, an area which is actually for the pasturage of animals. So they're following the same verses, just understanding them a little bit differently. So the point that I'm making here is that there's a lot of what we call as scholars common Judaism. So this stuff is common. But then when you take a look, I'm going to now give an example that shows the problem of Judaism in the Pharisaic way, the sectarian way, and in the early Christianity. So there's a story attributed to Jesus. It doesn't matter whether it's him or the early followers. that says, what would you do if one of your animals fell in a pit? And I admit this is one of those examples where we're lucky. We have all three groups. What would you do if your animal pulled a vent? So the answer is, of course, you'd put on Shabbat. Now, we have to assume that there's water in the pit or dangerous animals. Otherwise, you could just leave them until after Shabbat. So the answer is you take them out. That's what Jesus says. Now, if you go to the Pharisees, we assume for a moment that the Mishnah reflects their view, you find that you're supposed to bring pillows and stuff and create a situation where the animal can climb out on his own. So it's your indirect help of the animal, just like your indirect help to an animal giving birth on Shabbat. However, if you look at the Dead Sea sectarians, the animal should be left to die. Now, that wouldn't happen with a human, but the animal, just leave him there. You're not allowed to touch him. Now, here you see that the Qumran people are the strictest. The Pharisees, rabbis are in the middle. And Jesus and his followers are more lenient. Now, without going into a lot of examples of this, I think you have to come to a conclusion that, they were, that Jesus and his followers were much more lenient. Now, I have to tell a little funny story. I was once on a committee that they claimed that the Jews were advisors. It was a Catholic committee to recommend changes in Catholic textbooks to take out anti-Semitism. This was in 1983, and the truth is that it worked, because very few Catholic textbooks that are used in any American Catholic school have anything that we would object to. So at this committee meeting, the, they were going to say that the Catholic guys, uh, three quarters of whom had Jewish names, somebody in the family converted. These are the, look, there's a lot to be said that converted Jews led the fight against anti-Semitism in the, in the church, right? There's no question. Uh, the famous Monsignor Ostreicher, who was a very big leader, this is the alternate version to the Professor Heschel version of the story, and it may be that they all work together indirectly, but a lot of converted Jewish families that had become Catholic, that their, their children who were priests were involved in this a lot. So anyhow... The uh, story that I was telling, so people there wanted to write that Jesus was an Orthodox Jew of his time. And I said, hold it a second. Why don't we tell the truth, which is that Jesus took some more lenient views about halakha. And a guy answered me with a Jewish name. He said, if you say that, they're going to say that's why they killed him. Hmm. Well, I answered that. I said, I don't think this is right. I think our job is to tell the truth and teach people how to relate to the truth in a non-anti-Semitic way. And everybody agreed with me. But it was a very telling statement. But the bottom line is that Jesus had, or his followers, had much more lenient view to Shabbat law than did the Pharisees. So he has the Pharisee ethics, a left-wing, uh, what do you call it, open Phariseeism view for uh, halakha. And then we don't know if the sectarian influences on Christianity come from him or from his followers. They're definitely there. And you can give a lot of examples of that as well. Certain the light and darkness imagery that appears once in a while, which is like the, the material. You also have this tendency, which uh, is very important, of so-called fulfillment passages, which is similar to the Psharim and Quran. Not that it's direct, but this whole thing was in the air. Jesus as a priestly Messiah while being a priest and a sacrificial offering also, which is in the epistle to Hebrews. So it's, it's a whole combination, complex thing. But, but it sounds like this is exactly what the Dead Sea Scrolls have done, is to really illuminate that time period. Right. And, and far from undercut the, uh, you know, the underpinnings of the religions, is give it a, really more of a context about how all these things came about. So we're lucky today that Christian scholars want the context that the scrolls and other Jewish literature and Judaism in general provides. So as a result of this, they love this stuff to be done right. 
in the early scrolls days, they were trying to find direct connection, exaggerated, crazy things, what I call the Christianization of the scrolls. That's no going on. There's a tremendous match, uh, maturation, you might say, and a feeling today that the scrolls give us a kind of a background which have helped also to create better Jewish-Christian relations because Christians realized how they come from Jews, and Jews realize that Christians evolved and still carry many of their old traditions. And when you add to that the effect of the Holocaust on many Christian groups, not all, but many, in terms of making sure to get away from anti-Semitism, so we have a whole different atmosphere in which to understand first century Judaism and Christianity. So what do you say about the idea that the New Testament blames the Jews for a lot of things that the Romans really did because they're living under the Romans and they're afraid of the Romans, they're not afraid of the Jews, and therefore they're what there was and hopefully isn't anymore, Christian anti-Semitism, because that's what they learned. They learned that it was the priests that did this and all the terrible Jews that did this. Well, first of all, I don't know if I think that the reason why the Christians blame the Jews is because they were living under the Romans. I think it's more complicated. I think there was an unbelievable disappointment that they weren't followed by the Jews, as there was also by the early Muslims that the Jews didn't follow them. And we still live with that problem today, even though the Christian problem has been so much not eliminated, but greatly abated, certainly in the Western parts in the U.S. and other things. Now, having said this, some of the things that they claim the Jews were blamed for, that's not what it says in the New Testament. So the New Testament at the most blames the Jews for turning Jesus over, which is not the same thing as the people who would talk about Christ killers. And, you know, some kid in a school somewhere that said to a Jewish guy in 1935 in an American public school, although actually I know some more recent stories, but who said, you killed my God. Because this is absurd, because even the New Testament itself says that the Romans did it. However, the problem is that the New Testament does grant a relationship to Jews. But now here's the key point. There is a history to the New Testament stories. And we have to remember there are four Gospels. Three of them we call the Synoptics. That's, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is the earliest. And then you get John. What John did was to shift the blame and shift various accounts from the Pharisees or even Sadducees to the Jews. And he is a major part of our problem. And then certainly, although now there are new interpretations of Paul, what they, they, they understand Paul in a non-anti-Semitic way, but the reality is that the old-fashioned perspective of Paul was that he was blaming the Jews for a tremendous amount. And we have to remember the so-called blood curse, the, the verse that the Jewish actress who played Mary Magdalene was able to get out of the translation on the, on the film of Mel Gibson's Passion which was that verse from Matthew, what they call the blood curse, you know, may his blood be upon us and all our children forever, said by the priests when Jesus was being crucified, which of course I'm sure they never said. But at any rate, that verse itself was a cause of a lot of the anti-Semitism. But the reality is that the text of the New Testament doesn't say the Jews did it. So there's the responsibility of the teachers, really, of the priests now in the church to teach Christians the, what it really says and not interpret so, it the other so way. We have to be careful when we say the church because there is no one church. So when we look at Catholicism in the enlightened countries, they're explaining the New Testament in a way that we would find to be good for us. When we speak about certain Protestant groups, in the U.S. and elsewhere, they have done this also. The reality is the Catholics in the Ukraine, Eastern Christians, don't have any of this kind of equipment, and they continue to tell the same story. And the only reason why in those countries we don't have problems much worse than we do have is because most people don't care what the priests say and because most people don't care about those, their religion anymore. And but, because the Jews really aren't there in Moss anymore yeah, since well, the Second World War. No, but you have to be very careful because anti-Semitism without the Jews is easy. You don't need Jews. It can even be easier to be anti-Semitic when there are no Jews, because if there is an actual Jew, right? So now I'm going to tell, you, tell, tell an amazing story that was told to me by a cardinal. And this is Cardinal Casper, who used to represent, he was, he was the church's person in charge of relations with the Jews. So I heard him give a speech. And in the speech, which was given to young Catholic and Jewish leaders at a kind of a retreat, he said that if you hate somebody, you can't, if you, if, you, if you look in someone's eyes, you can't hate them. 
And then he began to tell a story about himself. And afterwards, I asked him to tell me the whole story. And here's the story. He was 12 years old when his father was drafted into the German army. They lived in a small village where everyone was Catholic. His mother called him into the house one day and he said, there's something very important I have to tell you. We don't support what the government is doing and we don't support what they're doing to the Jews. Now, every single Catholic kid in town is being told this by his parents now, but you may not speak to any other child about it because if you do, they will take me away to a concentration camp. He said, now I understood what it meant to be afraid to speak up for what you believe. Now, I know those who listen to the story and they say, oh, it's all bull, that's what they said afterwards. It, it, it isn't all bull. Obviously, Hitler had a lot of support. But this man is telling the truth that he had to stand by as a 12-year-old knowing what was going on and knowing that it wasn't what he believed in. And um, obviously, we, we, how much to generalize, not to generalize, you could debate. But they, they you see the problem. But that's these people that w with which we've accomplished a lot now. The problem is there's still people running around teaching anti-Semitism and by reading the New Testament in a way, not simply the text itself, but you can, on top of it, make it worse, like in the Gibson movie, by the way. So you are part of relation, like relationships between Christians and Jews as in your spare time, which is not. Well, I, don't, I don't have any spare time. <laughs> I'm a representative of the Orthodox Union to an organization called IJKIC, the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Inter Consultations. We are the organization that represents the Jews in dealing with international Jewish, uh, international religious agencies. We do not touch anything that's not international, and we don't compete with the groups that fund us for uh, in, in the United States, it's the main uh, defense groups like the, the ADL, the Jewish, American Jewish Committee, and the World Jewish Congress, and then the main religious groups through the rabbi and synagogue organizations in Israel. It's an organization called Ichkir. The World Jewish Congress covers the rest of the world in a certain way. We invite a lot of extra people to our meetings so that we can somehow represent world Jewry. And we're, that's, oh, we're the official dialogue partner in the Vatican, which is the most important thing. And we have various meetings every two years. We have formal meetings with Vatican representatives. I just came back from informal meetings that we had with these various organizations. And we met with the Eastern Orthodox in Jerusalem. And then we were at the Vatican for not a formal meeting. We have informal meetings. We go around and meet people who run different departments. And it's much more worthwhile than, you know, phony speeches and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a very funny thing when we come to the Vatican. It's like, oh, we're here with friends. People would not believe the informality of friendship really? that exists. Yeah, because these people, let's put it, the bad guys are all gone. That's the bottom line. Vis-a-vis -vis Jews and Jews, the bad guys are all gone. Now, I know some people don't like the Pope gave a speech, he this and that. You have no idea what the speech might have been like in the past. This is the bottom line. Now they speak for, for, for peace, two-state solution. It used to be Jerusalem as corpus separatum. It used to be it's all the fault of the Jews. It used to be the Jews have no right to be ruling over Israel. They forget about Jerusalem, right? Mm -hmm. The whole thing is, 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 is... We had a Hanukkah party hosted by the Israel, Israeli ambassador to the Vatican on the first night, and you had all these priests singing Maos Sor from transliterated <laughs> text and, and delicious kosher-catered latkes and, 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 and stuff like this. It, 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 it is a different world there in the Vatican. And I know it's funny, people understand what the Vatican is because they read the Da Vinci Code or something, right. right? I mean, so people, one guy asked me a couple of years ago, I was giving a lecture. I was going to Rome to give a lecture at the Pontifical uh, Biblical Institute and also to do something at the home of the Israeli ambassador. I was going on the tax money of the Israelis. Anyhow, so they tried to convince me to go through Moscow so they could save money at home. Look, I'm doing a voluntary thing. For the state of Israel, buy me a ticket from New York to Rome. What do you want, right? So they finally did. She said, the woman says to me, I had, I'm required to ask. <laughs> I mean, you think anybody would go to Moscow to go from the U.S. to Rome? Okay. Anyhow, the point uh, that I'm saying, I went to give this lecture. And a guy says, oh, you're going to be Can you get me into the Vatican? They actually believe this. Some kind of wall of thing. And most of the places where we go in the Vatican are office buildings. They may be very old. They can be inside the little, the, the legal Vatican where you got to go the, say hello to the Swiss guards, who are all very nice young guys, you know. So how do you deal with people who say, go to the Vatican and get down to the basement and find the, the menorah, menorah and ah. find the gates to the temple? So I got to say something really funny. So we're at the Vatican in our meeting, right? And we have to light the menorah, right? They're bringing out this, this, this crummy Chanukiah, right? So the whole <laughs> joke... With these cardinals that are all these guys, hey, let's get the menorah. Come on, where's the real menorah? Yeah, look, 
people have to understand a very simple fact. The Vatican did not start in the first century. There was no papacy in the first century. This is their belief, right? But it's not quite the way it is, right? Now, the Vatican started in the 700s. Rome was sacked repeatedly. So wherever these things, they were in Rome, wherever these things went, they were melted down and they disappeared. And the Vatican doesn't have anything. What does the Vatican have? The Vatican has a wonderful manuscript collection, mm -hmm. all of which is cataloged. The people from the National Library were there for like a year, several years ago, recataloging, and any person could find the catalog on the internet published by the Vatican. They have, uh, the library happens to be, uh, was closed for renovations, but it's now open again. They have an amazing collection of Hebrew manuscripts, and it's open to any legitimate scholar or student who gets a letter of introduction. Now, they have, I actually went to the basement of the Vatican Museum to see their Judaica collection. It's nothing. It's an old Torah and some chauffeurs and a few, and a few Megillas and a few menorahs. And when they need well, real Jew Jewish stuff, they get it from the Jewish Museum or from Ancona, where there's a very good Jewish collection. And the bottom line is they don't have any of this stuff. And, and, and anyone who believes they have, it, unfortunately, now you can never convince the Jews. After this is aired, you will get emails that I'm crazy and I don't know what I'm talking about because you cannot convince the Jews. Now, I could tell you that I know in the United States where this myth came from. There was a rabbi who published manuscripts in the Vatican, and he had to raise money, and he went to men's clubs on Sunday mornings in American shuls, Reformed, Conservative, and Orthodox. He was a man with very religious man, and he would go around and he would make a speech about the Vatican, and he would claim that he saw these things. And he convinced millions of people about this. And then the, there are other people who were spreading this idea in Israel. It, it, simply, it simply is not true. And the Vatican has been forthcoming on exhibiting some of their, their manuscripts in Israel. And the reality is that there's a lot of scholarly cooperation. And people shouldn't believe this kind of uh, uh, treasure hunting nonsense. Because if they had the stuff, they, would, they could make a fortune exhibiting it. Let me just tell you a funny story, which is the reverse. So we have in Israel this boat from the time of Jesus. There's no evidence Jesus was ever in the boat. The boat was taken to the Vatican. And after it was taken to the Vatican and brought back to Israel and put wherever it is in the Galil, you, yeah. So what happens now is every Christian group has to see the boat. Do you know how much money is being collected because the thing was in the Vatican for a while? Every single person has to go there and see this boat. And it's a very nice boat, but you know, it turned out to be a very big profit maker for the state of Israel. So you know, we, we have stuff too that they would love to have. And, and but there have. will be someone who writes to me and says they just didn't show it to him. That's, That's, right. What it's That's right. You see, because I think that one of the things, now we go back to the statement I made, you can't hate somebody. Well, you also can't trust someone until you met them and got to know them. And, you know, when you sit at an informal, really friendly meeting with somebody who is, for the sake of argument, the foreign minister or the secretary of state, was the secretary of state in the Vatican is the number one person under the pope or the pope himself, but the pope is not meetings. I, I've met him a few times, but it's not meetings. It's all formalistic. He's a very friendly guy. He walks in the, in the room and says hello nicely to everybody, but then starts a, you give a speech, he gives a speech, and everybody either gets a tea or leaves. And the bottom line is that's like nothing happens. It's just a, a, it's a photo op, as they say. But when you get to know people, you have a feeling that they're being sincere with you, and that's just something which is just personal. And yeah, they could be all defrauding us. But you know, this is this is a hope. All conspiracy theories are fed on that you can't prove that something crazy isn't true. So you can't prove that so and so in Russia isn't running the U.S. government. Right. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, that's what it amounts to. I mean, but I don't. Could I, this repair in Christian Jewish relations, as you're describing it, be somewhat a reaction to? Muslims now, like we have a shared oh, yeah. enemy? Oh, yeah. I, I, they wouldn't say that. They don't like to say anyone's their enemy. And they have people behind their lines, and they're trying to, whatever they can do, protect them, even though they don't operate like us, which is a, another matter, right? They're not opening their mouths, and they're doing it quietly, and they're making the same mistake that they made, that they claim they made in the Holocaust. They claim that they thought that only quiet diplomacy, and therefore they didn't say anything. They're doing with their own people right now. And their own people are dying while well, they do quiet diplomacy, and we try to tell them that. And they listen, but they still go on and do quiet diplomacy. We've told them that a lot of times, that it's a big mistake. But um, I would say that that's close to true, although the present pope is less willing to say it than his predecessor, Pope Benedict, was, who got in trouble for saying it. But I think there is a general feeling of the West being under attack. 
And not only that, there's a general feeling that certain values would be under attack that Jews and Catholics share. So a very interesting thing at the uh, meeting with the person who's in charge of the congregation for whatever they call it, the maintenance of the faith, whatever it is, which is the old Inquisition turned into a, again, this organization, uh, Luis Larida, I believe, is the name of this priest. So one of the priests who was there said to him, talking about Judaism, so if you understand that sometimes Jews and Catholics have the same values with different results. So his example was abortion. He said, we have exactly the same values about human life. The difference is that the Jews believe that under certain circumstances that can be bent for abortion, and we don't. But if you ask what is the value of human life and how do we relate to a human life, that's all the same. And so it's an interesting point. I said, he's right. He said the values and ethics and morals are very much the same, although we sometimes and they sometimes put them into action a different way. So there's the turn of the other cheek and not turn the other cheek, but we all agree that a person shouldn't insult someone, shouldn't hit someone, shouldn't rob somebody, go on and on like that. We agree. It's just that there's a different, we do different things in reaction. And I think that uh, that's a very good observation. But all I could say about, you know, they're swindling us, this kind of thing, right? They certainly haven't swindled us on the manuscripts. They let the Israeli scholars come in and just roam the place because there was a feeling that sometimes inside, say, a Greek manuscript, there may be the middle, a Hebrew manuscript bound in the binding. And that's what they were looking for. They were looking for, they knew they had about 300 uncatalogued items, and they were looking to see what else. They went through the whole manuscript collection of the Vatican Library, which is free run of the place. So, of course, that, again, there are people who say, well, how do you know that a hiding manuscript somewhere else? Hey, there's, there's no end to this. How do we know that, that the government of whatever country we live in isn't hiding the truth that aliens are taking over the country, and, and they're keeping from us that Donald Trump is really a Martian, or, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, right? I mean, this is crazy. You have people who they make up stories. It's like, you, can't, you can't live with that. I, I think it's a fair statement to say. And by the way, in this case, the argument is greatly strengthened by the how could they possibly have it argument, because they always started the Vatican in the 700s. So where would they gotten the thing? And how come there's no account of it after the account in the time of the Mishnaic rabbis? So I think it's pretty obvious that they don't have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to jump back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sure. So you've been a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls now for how long? About uh, 47 years. As a traditional Jew, at least your appearance is definitely one of an Orthodox Jew, I can make that assumption. Has the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls in any way changed your view of Judaism, your theories about Judaism, if not your core belief, then, you know, we talk about biblical criticism and a lot of these things. Where do you fit into this? So I think I would say it has, let's just say, supplemented or in certain ways the way I understand things. Look, let me give an example. You discover in the Dead Sea Scrolls that there were several versions of the, de of the biblical text. Now, we know that the biblical text that we have did exist at Qumran, but along with it are some slightly different versions. And we know that when you get to Masada and the Bar Kokhba caves, they cease to exist. But that means that these versions came from somewhere. Now, for example, we have certain books like Jeremiah, where there is a manuscript which constitutes the version translated into Greek which is not the same as the one in our Bible because certain chapters are in a different order and it tends to be shorter. Now, I just quote that as an example. Now, the scrolls will never tell us about the composition of the Torah or the Bible because they are much later than the composition. They're all from, let's say, 225 on, 225 BCE, running up through a little bit after the turn of the era. But what they do show us certainly is that at that time, you can't argue that there was only exactly one form. But now I go back and I look at the Gomorrah, and I come to the conclusion that actually the rabbis told me this if I would be smart enough to understand it. By looking at a whole variety of passages, I have evidence that the Bible is being standardized. Now, we hope that the one that was standardized is, we'll call it the earliest original, or whatever you want to say. But the fact that such a process happened is known from the Talmudic rabbis. So here I see the actual practice. The difference is that you can, let's say, study the whole Talmud, like people study the Daf Yomi, the page every day, and you just read through these things without realizing it. You look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I better understand that there was a looser text situation at some point in our history than the one that we're used to later on. Say even in the Middle Ages when the differences are very, very small. 
So there is your example where a core Jewish idea of the Bible being passed down, and maybe someone who say what I'm telling you now is heresy, by the way. Of course, it's, it can't be heresy if it's fact. This I quote, I live on this, I live by the Rambam, the Moran of Uchim, the guide for the perplexed. He says it is not possible to have a conflict between science and Torah for the simple reason that if it's true, they both are true, they can't conflict. We have to deal with how to understand that. So the person who says, well, a fact is heresy, is basically simply off base. You can't say a fact is heresy. Somebody would tell you that it's heresy to say that the world is a sphere and not flat, right? As some people did for a while. Or it's heresy to say that the uh, earth goes around the sun. Right? It can't be. So it can't be heresy to say that these there existed at this time in the hands of some Jews, some other text. And this allows me to understand what's going on in the Gomorrah much, be- much better. So that's, it's, that's an example of the thing. The other thing is that we have a much richer sense of the groups that existed in the inner history than we would have gotten if we only had rabbinic literature. I think that, so there are ways in which it causes you to look at things a little bit differently. But I haven't found anything that doesn't really fit in, so to speak, in some way. But again, if you had a more fundamentalistic approach to start with, you'd have a big problem. That I will admit. So I'm always fascinated with the idea of the world to come because it's not really a biblical idea, but it is so prevalent in the second in the second, second temple, temple period. The, but you say you're saying the Sadducees didn't feel that. So there's there's a theological difference here, a huge theological yeah. difference. But today's Judaism and and Christianity, you know what what's born out in that first century, do. So where does that idea come from of the world to come? Okay, so first of all, it's important to realize that the book of Daniel, which could be the latest book in Tanakh, does have those ideas. For example, the resurrection of the dead is in Daniel, I think it's chapter 12, if I remember. And so you have these kinds of ideas. Now, these ideas develop, and what we see in the Second Temple, now we can see, they didn't used to be able to see, is they develop extensively. So when we get to the rabbis and we start to see these ideas, especially in Sanhedrin, in the chapter per, called Perak Chelek, a section that starts right out, well, Israel has a portion of the world to come, right? It has by that time become normative that after death there is another world. Now the problem is whether the world to come is the Messianic era, or it's the revival of the dead, or it's just life after death. There are a lot of debates about this and a lot of different opinions. But it becomes clear to us that these are views that were held certainly by sectarians in Second Temple times, and probably by the Pharisees, but we can't really know. But the minute we see the Pharisees in action, we get a statement like that statement that I just quoted of the, of the rabbis. So it does appear that it's an old Jewish idea that in Second Temple. Now, it may have even been an earlier idea because we should not fall into the trap of believing that in the Bible we have the sum total of ideas that anybody said or believed in biblical times. And, and not only that, we also know a lot of people in biblical times you know, we're half worshiping idols. So, but of the people who were following the Devium, the prophets, etc., we don't know everything that they believe. We just know what's written in these books. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a discussion actually I had with someone earlier today. Maybe it's not discussed because it was just so obvious. Like it wasn't even an issue in well, the first temple period. I'm not sure if you can say it's not really an issue. Remember that one of the things that is discussed is life after death in terms of all human beings going to one place, Sheol, the netherworld. And they sort of hang out in the netherworld until such time as we don't know, right? But, but that's, that's what's in the Bible, in Sefer Tehillim. And it's all over the place. And that may be step one. And then you got Daniel telling you they're going to be brought back to life. And then it starts to develop what it must be like in that afterlife. Now, of course, in Christianity, simultaneously, the same thing is happening, but they would be, it would be easy to explain that they derived it from us, right? right? But they, there's even debate about the Dead Sea Scrolls because there are many passages there that seem to believe that everything's going to happen in their lifetime, so it's really not the world to come. But on the other hand, we have some other literature which has like the standard ideas. There are standard messianic ideas. There are standard ideas of life after death and world to come. And remember, there is, I say standard ideas, it's not the right word, because there is no one standard idea in Judaism. What I meant by standard ideas is the same one that come up later in medieval and even up right into modern times. What's your theory about why the book of Esther was it found among the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, there are two possibilities about why Esther's not found. Possibility number one, it fell 
on the floor when some Bedouin was selling the scrolls because you must remember they're very small pieces of some of the books. And that possibility was the one I used to favor. Now that all of the calendar texts are published, they list all the holidays, they have no Purim. So they may have had no Purim because they didn't accept rabbinic holidays. They probably, they had no Hanukkah because they didn't like the Hasmoneans. They thought that they were false rulers and et cetera, et cetera. And so it may very well be that they rejected that, that holiday. Of course, a final other argument is the argument that we know in a certain sense, from the Greek Esther, where they added the prayers and some religious piety, that there's no prayer and there's no religious piety in Esther, and maybe they just didn't consider it a religious book. That's a third possibility, but it's something of those things. We do know that Esther influenced the language of some scrolls' texts, but what we don't know is, oh, and one other thing, there's a text they claim is proto-Esther, which is a bad name, for a court tale in which the name Esther doesn't exist, but they restored it from a broken olive, so it's not really true. And this text is a court tale similar to Esther, which is part of the same genre of court tales. But it's not Esther. So another conversation I was having with someone today, this was great about Limud, is you, yeah. just, you sit at meals and you start talking about people's about the calendar. And one of the things that he said is that he thinks that the calendar is really the the common element that we have now during in all streams of modern Judaism right so we may we may have a discussion about how we're going to celebrate certain holidays but no one's going to argue about when Passover falls right. out right. now in the olden days that isn't true there are actually different calendars and when it comes let's say to the Dead Sea sect they had a, they had Larry they had a, a solar calendar they had a completely different calendar so when do you think that that kind of merges all together to one more accepted calendar in the Jewish world Right. This is a very good question. Before I, will, I answer it, I will tell you, however, about a funny story where when they move around Yom Ha'atzma'ut because of Shabbat and stuff like this, where you could say Hallel in one Orthodox synagogue on one day for Yom Ha'atzma'ut, go to the one around the corner and say Hallel at that synagogue for Yom Ha'atzma'ut on the next day, and they couldn't decide when Yom Ha'atzma'ut was. Now, this is crazy, but you can get a sample there what calendar controversy is like. Now, first of all, we have to go back and mention that the calendar of the Bible is lunar months. However, the lunar months have to, every three years, approximately equal the solar months, and that's why we have the extra month and other things. This apparently was the case in biblical times because we have considerable information about the calendar from Phoenicia and other places that ran a similar lunar calendar, as well as Babylonia, which is where our month names come from. Now, the second thing is what happens when we get to Second Temple times. So there is a debate because there is a whole bunch of scholars who believe, I think very incorrectly, that the solar calendar, by which we mean solar months and solar years, was the main calendar in the temple and the lunar was reformist. This, I think, is totally wrong, but I have to tell it to you so someone shouldn't say, oh, he didn't tell the truth about it. <laughs> the other view that I hold is that the lunar month as we say, make going, we call that the Ludi solar, right? Because it has to equal the solar every three years, unlike the Muslim calendar where they don't do that. So that calendar, I think, was the norm. And I think the sectarians, which means the Dead Sea sectarians, the author of two Second Temple books, Jubilees and Enoch's, those authors, they all wanted a calendar which would be the same every year. Now, what's the calendar that's the same every year? 30-day month, 30 30-day month, 30-day 30 month, 30 31-day 30 month. 30, 30, 31, it comes to 364. Now, we have manuscripts that say, right, Ushlema Hashana, right? Shlosh Meot, this is a riot. Shlosh Meot Shishim Arba Ayamim. It says that, but guess what? It's 365 and a quarter. And every Babylonian knew that. Now, we have evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls that Babylonian astronomy was known in Eretz Yisrael because the calendar texts have all the same kind of tables and all that, and because they link this solar calendar that they had as sectarians with the lunar one, because they had the same problem we have as Jews. We need a calendar that tells us what Zion Marcheshvan is in Israel, because you're going to start Talmud Matar praying for, for uh, rain. So you got to know when that is. So you got to know what date that is in the secular calendar. So they had that because they were running a minority solar calendar in a loony solar environment. So what seems to have happened is that this idea, if they ever tried the calendar, it would fail because the holidays would be shifting because look what's going on. If you go through one year, look how much you're off by. The plane 
solar calendar is off by a year and a quarter every a year. It's a day and a quarter every year. So a day and a quarter every year is, yeah, that's like 64, 64, 65 days in, in, in 40 years. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it doesn't work. Right. Well, because we're harvesting people, our holidays have to happen at a certain right. time of the right. year. So anyhow, so in my opinion, that calendar never was really used, and the Jews stuck. Now, we still didn't have total unity because people were doing it by observation. And we know that sometime in the mid-4th century, the Jews switched. Now, people say it's Hillel the, the second. That comes from a much later tradition. We don't really know. And furthermore, there's evidence that when the switch was made, it was made all over the world, but made it different ways in different places. So they were still slightly off sometimes. Then the calendar was adjusted further by the Gaonim in Babylonia until they got what we call the Dichyot, which is where you add days and subtract days. So it's not totally by the exact actual moon rise and set, but you create a situation or the new moon, and the, and you create a situation now where it could be really calculated. And when it's really calculated, we end up with the same calendar, except for the famous fight between Rav Sadia Gaon and Ben Meir, in which you have a whole fight over when Yom Kippur would be, and you have Jews observing a different day, and that never again. Never, ever again, because of the understanding of how serious this was, and you, you'll never have it again. And you'll, one of the reasons you never have it again is because all the rules for calculating the calendar are now public. So you can calculate it, and I can calculate it. Each one of us get our computer program going. So I can't tell you that Yom Kippur that you're saying is wrong because we're all doing the same rules. So, so the final end of it is the Gaonic period. And from then on, you'll never have the situation. That's a total unifier. Before that, it was an almost total unifier. Well, you do have the Karaites who have yeah. a different calendar. Karaites, by the way, throwing, they, they wanted to throw in the towel. So the Karaites still run on a different calendar because they insist on observation of the moon. Now, I actually got a Karaite calendar once for one year. It was kind of interesting to see what they, what they said. But they, there was somebody in Israel who had the idea that they better switch the calendar because it's crazy to not observe the holidays the same day the rest of the Jews do. You imagine your kid is in school and it's Pesach, but no, I don't have Pesach now. I have Pesach five days from now. And this guy, and by the way, the Samaritans also don't follow the same. The Shomronim, okay. Now, although the Karaites, at least according to Rav Avadi Yosef, are considered Jews, like they don't have right. to convert, but the Samaritans are not. Yeah, that is all true, but they don't follow. Neither one follows our calendar. So anyhow, there was some rabbi who wanted to switch over, and he got kicked out, and he had to move to San Francisco. It's a true story, Karaite from Ashton. He got kicked out and became the rabbi of the Karaites in San Francisco, where I don't know, I have no idea if they observe the same days as regular Jews or not. Can you imagine the Karaite kid coming to his public school and saying, I have to take off for a Jewish holiday, but not on Monday, the other kids are. Mine is on Wednesday. They're going, what are you, crazy? So anyhow, the, the bottom line is that, that the, the Karaites still have their own calendar, which is not the same one that we have. So one last thing, and then I'll let you go. Uh, you think there's any surprises left when it comes to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Are there still scrolls that have not yet really been studied or in process? Any, any little clue you can well, give us? There's really nothing that hasn't been studied. Everything is published, published and everything is available on the website of the Israel Antiquities Authority. However, the Antiquities Authority has begun a new set of exploration of the caves. All caves, not just the ones they found, all kinds of caves. And this is in accord with their responsibility, despite the fact that it's unlikely anything will be found. They may find other things. It's unlikely, but they're doing the right thing. They, they have people that organize a new project, and as a result of this, they found what they call the 12th cave. I don't like that name, but at any rate, it's a cave in which they had writing material was discovered, but no scrolls. Now, it's important to also know that post-2002, about 75 fragments appeared on the market, and there is serious question if these fragments are real. And these fragments are owned by mostly private collectors. The Antiquities, Israel Antiquities Authority, the IAA, was smart enough not to buy them, not because they knew they were forged, but because they said, look, we have so many Dead Sea Scrolls fragments, like, you know, 80,000, right? We're not going to pay millions to get these pieces that otherwise are going to responsible people who are publishing them and making them available to scholars anyhow. So they, they did the right thing. And now it turns out that they, some of them or all of them or whatever may be forged. Wow. So it's possible that things will continue to appear. It's not, it's not, they may not be real. And one has to be very careful. I know there's one particular manuscript where the Antiquities Authority made a big deal about it. 
They tried to arrest somebody who bought it from the Bedouin, even though he gave it to them. It's a whole long story. The bottom line is now there's a question if this thing is real. And so it's going to be a while before some of the issue over the possibly forged material sound sorts out. And I think it's unlikely that they will find anything, but it's totally possible because, okay, what is the percentage of unlikely, right? Is it 25, 75 or is it, you know, 99, one? I don't know. And they're just doing the right thing in their position. It's costing them a lot of money and they're re-exploring the whole area in the hope that they may find something, which by the way was done era of the giving of Jericho, et cetera, to the Palestinian Authority, they did the same thing. And they brought their a team, large team of archaeologists, soldiers, and Bedouin, and students, and they combed the whole place, and they did find a few things from the Bar Kokhba era, so some legal documents, and um, they found somebody who had died 15 years before, a, a teenager who got lost, and they found a 5,000-year-old dead warrior. I think that's a list of what they found. But the point is they're, they're doing the, the job right, and they're going to re-explore with new resources and new efforts. So maybe we'll be... And watching. new equipment. I mean, they've got things that look, yeah. can look into spaces, yeah, and they're not just stuff. here. In Egypt, yeah. you hear about this all the time. So a, a lot of equipment. And, and, and not only equipment, right? They have a lot of know-how as to where these things are likely to be. And I think that, you know, we're going to see a very good effort, and one can only hope that something may come out of it. But if not... People should not complain. Don't say they wasted your money, your tax money. Mm-hmm. They did the right thing as the Israel Antiquities Authority is entrusted to do by the government, and they're doing a great job. So, by the way, while we're here, one other thing. The Israel Antiquities Authority short $17 million in order to complete their new center in Jerusalem. And people should encourage the government, whoever, ministers and others, to find a way to make that money available because that building has got to be finished because it's, it's just ridiculous that it's waiting to be finished. So I throw in that fundraising pitch <laughs> in the last couple of seconds. I'll write a letter to the prime minister since some of it is my money. So, uh, so looking back, I mean, you still, God willing, will have many years of research to do. Um, but looking back on now, it's 45 years of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So could you have imagined when you're studying Near Eastern studies and you're going to school and someone throws this out, you know what, maybe do a paper on that, where you would be today? No, I never imagined, I'll tell you the truth. One of my colleagues pointed out sometime in the 90s or something, Dead Sea Scrolls turned into a public scene. And you have TV appearances and things like this, and people walk up to me every once in a while and say, well, do I recognize you from somewhere? But I, I have got a lot of television programs in the U.S. And one time my granddaughter from Israel called. She was watching TV, and she called and said, I'm watching you on TV right now, right, in Israel. And uh, once a guy came back that I know from uh, someplace in India or something, he told me that he watched me on TV in, in, in India. So the truth of the matter is that we became, in a certain form, public figures with a lot of people who recognize us, read our stuff, you mention your name, and people say, oh, I read, you know, you're going to a kosher restaurant in New York, you know, it's the whole other story. All kinds of people talk to you. And so I never dreamt that that would be the case. I also never dreamt that we would accomplish so much as a group. And here I want to emphasize a very wonderful thing. First of all, the Jewish and Christian scholars and Dead Sea Scrolls all work together beautifully. Israelis, people from outside Israel, that's the first thing. And second of all, we've had these beautiful exhibits all over the place. We have trained a whole bunch of a new generation of scholars that don't anymore have to deal with is it published, is it not published. They're doing fantastic work. If you go to a conference like the Society for Biblical Literature in New York, and we're going to be having, by the way, we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the, the, uh, of the scrolls now. So if you go to a conference that you see all these wonderful young people giving papers, we had a 70th anniversary celebration in New York. We're going to be having one uh, in Israel the last day of April, the beginning of May. And these programs show a level of scholarship and development and public interest that no one could have ever imagined. And the impact of this material on getting people to study in Second Temple period and all this is wonderful. And nobody would have believed that that, that could have really been accomplished. Mm-hmm. And somehow or another, people at different universities, different places, different countries, but that met together at a lot of conferences and have very close relationships managed over time to produce this wonderful effect. And I have to tell you, one of the last ingredients, which is phenomenal, is that the Israel Antiquities Authority got itself geared up to become part of this. 
as opposed to being battered by us, we need this, we need that. Ugh, okay, if you come here, somebody help. They turned over the whole thing, starting with the website, technical work, all kinds of stuff, wonderful people working there, and, and become really together with the group of scholars. This wonderful things are going on there. And so I would say you should come to our 70th anniversary. Your readers should come to the 70th anniversary. It's going to be a wonderful program. And uh, there are a lot of cooperating universities. We're one of the sponsors. And if I could rattle them all, all off, you've got the uh, you've got the Orion Institute of the Hebrew University, you've got the Israel Antiquities Authority, the, uh, the, the Israel Museum, New York University, and University of Vienna, and I think I got them all. These people all together sponsoring, this could be a wonderful program. I'm going to call up the office and say that Professor Schiffman invited me to come, and they're going to have to. You'll still have to pay the registration fee. That's okay. I guess we could say you're a scroll star, not a rock star, but a scroll star. Some people say that. I don't know. I don't want to be uh, claim too much credit. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, This was a fascinating interview, and thank you for all the work that you've done and for the lectures that you gave here. I very, very much enjoyed them. Okay, Eve Harrow, uh, still at Limud, coming home soon. Thanks, everyone, so much for listening. Rejuvenation on the Land of Israel Network. Thank you to Tabitha. Thank you to Ben. Write to me, eve at thelandofisrael.com. Take care, everybody. Goodbye for now.